This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and I am still over the pond. I'm over in England right now, going to go to a flower show. They uh, had to close all the flower shows and all the botanic gardens last year because of COVID, and they're opening a few up with appointment only. And uh, I'm going to start uh, visiting those in the next week or so. I'll be telling you some of the stuff, some of the ideas that I think will work in Mississippi gardens. If you're in Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, in the Deep South, there's some really cool ideas that can make a small garden a little bit more useful, a little bit more interesting, a little more entertaining, and a lot less maintenance. I'm not going to talk about the kind of plants that grow in England that won't grow in Mississippi any more than I talk about what will grow in Mississippi that won't grow in England. I'll give you a hint. They have to grow tomatoes in small greenhouses because there's not enough warmth here from the turn red. And forget okra and sweet potatoes. So uh, anyway, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about gardening in Mississippi and our neighbors. Hey, Java, what's going on, man? How's the weather? I understand we got some rain last night. Yeah, we can say that about, you know, every every other day we got some rain <laughs> last night. Yeah, we got a little a little bit here in central Mississippi. Well, that's good because, you know, when when I leave sometimes for weeks or even months at a time, I, I, I just park my truck out in the driveway, and it's got the garden in the back, and ain't nobody going to go over there and water it. So this is kind of a good thing for me. Um, I hope it's okay for farmers, but I think gardeners – they may be a little bit tired of some of the rain, but, hey, it's what keeps us from being West Texas. So everything's going okay with you and yours? Yeah, man, everything's going fine. I, I was listening to the news break. I don't know if you heard about the uh, the, the little girl who won the, the 93rd Scripps <laughs> National Spelling Bee and her winning her winning word. Was a, was a plant. Yeah. Mir- is it is it Mir- Miria? Uh, the uh, uh, the common known as Orange Jasmine. I said that's... Orange. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's probably it's from South Africa. Probably won't grow outside here. Yeah, it's a so, it's uh, a trop it's a tropical thing. I thought that was kind of neat though. She could she could smell uh, spell the genus word. <laughs> I, I I couldn't have done that. You know, I can tell you the Latin name of sweet gums is liquid ambar starassa flua, but I have no idea the Latin name of a lot of plants. You know, it's a live and learn kind of thing. I've written all these books and I got college degrees and blah 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 blah. But I learn something new every single week. I think it's kind of cool. But I wanted to ask, how are your kids Basil doing? Oh, man. Uh, we had to kind of. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Well, well, see, the thing, I, I, I'll say this. The thing was, um, well, my uh, wife had a, we had a death, we had a death in the family, and we yeah, had yeah. to go to a funeral, and we got some of the flowers, um, um, you know, from the funeral. So she brought, yeah. she brought them back and put them into some pots, and, we needed what well, she needed the pot and the basil oh, yeah. and the basil got the short end <laughs> of the stick. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I mean that the, the kids had to suffer. Bless her heart. Well but, but the what? but the but but the, the, the uh, to truth be told, the basil was suffering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. It was a mercy killing, huh? There we go. We do have we do have a, a phone call to start us off uh this morning if you ready to ready to get that started, well, Felder. Be, 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 before I do that, let me share a quote. My friend Charlie Reeves, he lives way out in the boondocks, but he posted something on the uh, Mississippi Gardening Facebook page. He said, I don't know why men go to bars and try to meet women. Go to the garden center. The female-to-male ratio is 10 to 1, and those women are already looking for stuff they don't need. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> okay, who who we got on the line? Well, let's go down to Lauderdale and, uh, and talk to Will. Will from Lauderdale. Hey, Will, what's up, man? Hey, Felder, how you doing? They let you outside yet? Yeah, they'll, they'll let me outside, but I can't go far. Most places are closed. But, oh, well, <laughs> it's a, I, I go for these long walks. I, I'm in the moors of Lancashire, sort of low hills, and the wild blackberries and wild blueberries and, and the, the wild orchids. It's just it's, a, it's an incredible place because you don't, I don't have to worry about walking through waist-high weeds because there's no snakes and there's no ticks and there's no poison ivy. <laughs> so what you got going on? What's up? I got a pear tree that in previous years has borne some delicious fruit, but this year all we got a little hard 
you know, about the size of a blueberry, but rock hard, not developing. Huh. And it's the, the same, that nothing's changed with the tree itself that you know of. The reason I'm asking because wild pears have real small, uh, small pears. But this nothing. is the same tree that had big ones last year. Exact same tree. It was a pineapple pear, yeah. Yeah, about the only thing that this is an educated guess, but I did study fruit science at Mississippi State. Uh, if it rained a lot, which it did during pollination when the trees in bloom, then uh, there's not much bee activity. If you don't get a lot of bee activity or pollinator activity, the seeds can't develop. And if seeds can't develop, some fruits will just abort when they're small or they never get any size on them. And so it could have just been it was raining really hard for the week when the when the flowers needed to be pollinated, something as simple as that. And they're not making seeds, so the fruit's not going to develop. Okay, so there's no no sense in trying to thin out the fruits and pray that it'll. Not a not a th- you know fruit thinning is what commercial growers do when the fruits are about this apples and pears are about and peaches when they're about the size of a marble they'll knock a lot of them off but if yours have been stuck at that size for a while well you try try it on a few clusters that are that are low enough to reach you know snip off all but two or three in each cluster and let's just watch and see what and let me know if that works but I'm not sure it will but it doesn't hurt to try. Yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, if you don't mind, I have a couple suggestions for things people to grow that I grew the first time this year that are just they're gangbusters, and I'm loving them. Great. What are, bring it on. Got uh, ground cherries. They're related to golden berries and tomatillos, and they produce yeah. these tiny little berries that taste like caramelized sweet pineapple. Yeah, and did you, did you order the seeds from someplace or what? Yeah, I had to order the seeds, but, I mean, I had no problems growing them here. Cool, 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 cool. Okay. And I got a Sicilian gourd, which I've always had issues with my summer squash getting eaten up by all kinds of little caterpillars and yeah. whatnot. But the Sicilian gourd, the, there's a lot of evidence that they've been trying to eat it, but they're not getting through. And it's ginormous and delicious <laughs> and use it just like you would a merlaton or zucchini. You know, and what's really strange is you can grow squash and cucumbers and gourds and melons side by side, but the squash are always going to get eaten up, and the gourds don't seem to have any problems at all. And they're the same genus. But but you call it Sicilian melon? Sicilian gourd. At least that's what, you know, I had to order seeds for this one, too. But, uh, yeah. yeah, they're called the cucuzza. Oh, I know what cucuzza is. Yeah, they're big long. Things. I hope you're eating them before they get long because, I mean, they, they could be like baseball bats. Yeah, no, I'm I'm getting them ripe and fresh. They're they develop incredibly quickly. You know, get them before the seeds get too hard and the skin gets yeah. too tough. Now, are their flowers yellow or white? They're white, and I will say yeah. I do have to hand pollinate them because they're blooming at night, and it seems uh, like yeah. there's not a lot of activity going on. Well, unless you got tomatoes, you know that big tomato hornworm. It's adult as a sphinx moth that pollinates stuff at night. But anyway, I've, I've heard some people call kukutsa gugutsa. But yeah, I've heard of that. Really cool. I'm glad to hear about this, man. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. And you, uh, you have a pub that you're going to be going to to get yourself a pint of bitter when you're allowed. You know, the, to to go to a pub here in England, you have to you have to sign up. You have to give them your name and phone number, and if one person gets the COVID symptoms, they call everybody who was there the week before, and you have to you have to uh, uh, quarantine for 10 days. So, nope, I ain't going into pubs. It half kills me, but there it is. Oh, let me throw out a, a thing for you to try next year. See if you can get your hands on some seeds of what they call Malabar spinach. Oh, you know what? I'm actually growing some of that right now. Ah, it, but... It's a cool plant. I, I, mine reseeds itself. When I left uh, a couple of three weeks ago, it was starting to climb up. It's not a vigorous vine, but it, it's a really good summer green. And mine were, I was real pleased to see mine survive, and it loves heat and drought. Ooh, cool, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Thank you so much. Hey, appreciate you sharing. This has been fun. Thank you. Yeah. All righty, Java. What's up, man? Oh man, that was that was informative. I want to see what was that the one he said tastes like caramelized pineapples, little berries. Yeah. He he called it ground cherry, ground cherry, and uh, I forget uh, it's related to to uh, to tomatoes and peppers, and it's in that same family, ground cherry. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go to Google and look that up. I mean, if I could just grow something that tastes like caramelized pineapples, I'm not mad at it. Well, listen, and uh, did your wife ever listen to this program? 
She does, because she felt that she quotes okay. you all the time. Okay, well, I was speaking to say, you can sneak my, my, my place. I got all sorts of pots out back. You're welcome to all you want, but don't tell her about them. Okay, maybe, maybe she wasn't listening <laughs> to that, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll surprise her. Yeah. We got any callers? Well, we're going to get them, uh, get them queued up. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and take our first break of the hour, Felder, and then we get these okay. calls lined up. Sounds real good, man. I appreciate it. Folks, uh, I am horticulture spell to rushing. Even though I'm over in England right now and, and uh, doing some studying, there's a lot of things that uh, I can talk about in Mississippi because I've been guarding Mississippi all of my life. I left a garden that I expect to be in full bloom when I get back. So if you've got some things you want to talk about, don't be put off by where I am or ain't. Let's talk about it. If I don't know it, somebody will call in and help us both out. That's the way it works on these these uh, locally produced MPB programs. We all share what we know. Again, we're going to take a real short break and come back with your phone calls here on the Gestalt Gardener on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Me and Jabba Chapman and all the other folks at MPB, we welcome you to this garden party, and we'll be right back. All righty, all righty, folks. I think that's about as cheesy a bumper tune as I've ever played, right, Java? <laughs> that rank, that that ranks up there. The pres, presidents of the United States that ranks up there. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Hey, before I get into some of the stuff I've got notes about, let's go up to Neshoba County and talk with Bill. Hey, Bill, thank you for calling, man. What's up? Uh, uh thanks for taking my call. Uh, sure. With the high winds we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a tree that we planted about five years ago, uh, one of the branches uh, broke. It's yes. about about 10 feet off the ground, a couple of feet above uh, a Y. But yeah. it's like a third of it, it took with it a third of that branch. Yeah. So my, my question is, should I, you know, I've cut it down, but is it, uh, should I cut off that whole branch? And Well, well here, just a little bit of background of what happens. What heals up cuts and wounds and broken areas on trees and shrubs is food flowing from the leaves down towards the roots. And they don't go back upstream on a limb that's nearby. So basically anything that would heal up that that broken area is gone. So what's going to happen if you don't cut it off, it's going to rot and decay right into the trunk. So what a tree surgeon would do, and I taught the course at Mississippi State, would be to get a saw and and make it and cut off the, the, the broken area as smoothly as you can, not quite flush with the rest of it, but almost flush. Sort of like if if you're gonna gonna take your thumb off, do it at that knuckle by your wrist, not halfway up the thumb. And right. if you'll do if you if you make a smoother cut, then food flowing from the part that's left will flow down around it and heal it up better. But if you don't, uh, it's gonna it's gonna decay. And it's not gonna be fun or easy. But um, and and the truth is, even if you don't do anything, if it he- decays, you might have some owls or something living in it. So if you don't get around <laughs> to it, it's not that big a deal. But uh, if if you could cut it off at a, at an angle as close to that other uh, to what's left in a straight line as you can. Okay. Uh, okay. So right now, where it broke, I kind of just cut it ninety degrees. To the branch so you're saying i should go back in and make it straight down yeah 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 go yeah. ahead you know that that whole thing cut it back to the fork is what i'm saying as uh, if it were never oh. as if it were ne- as, as if it were never there because okay. again the stuff what's left the food going from those leaves is going to flow straight down towards the root and that's where uh-huh. it's not going to go we're not going to go up even six inches so i'd go and by the way if you wanted to if somebody says you need to put some of that pruning paint, you know, the stuff you that they use, that's pure cosmetics. If you do that right. if you make somebody think better of you, but not because of the tree. <laughs> okay, time to get out the Sawzall, I guess. Yeah, not not that fun, but go for it, man. Okay, thank you. You bet, Bill. Thank you for calling. All righty, now let's fly down to the Gulf Coast to uh, southwestern Alabama and talk to Mikey in Mobile. Morning, Mikey. How are you? Wow, I can't believe that I'm talking to England for one thing. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, actually, actually, you're just talking to Jackson, and Java's taking it from there. 
<laughs> well, and I've got to say, what an incredible job the folks at MPB do, don't they? I mean, well, all y'all. Well, <laughs> all y'all, I appreciate that a whole bunch. Well, what can we help you with today? Um, I'd like to know, um, I need some communication advice, Elder. I've got uh, um, a friend who is a, a neighbor and um, looks like going to be a really good friend. And I want to do everything I can to help with um, getting, uh, she's just uh, become a generational inheritor, shall we say, you know. Right, right. Um, and I want to do the best I can to give her the best advice on what to do and how to do it. Can you give me some guidance, please? Well, you know, I wish I could give myself that advice just because, I mean, I get I get asked stuff every day. I get dozens of emails every day, and I'm stumped on quite a bit of it. And basically, I just Google it and hope for the and, – and wade through the, the junk that's out there. You know, I don't know – the, may the, I interrupt? The, I'm sorry. Um, sure, may the, I interrupt and say, um, because this is a close enough neighbor, and I, I, I've known the parents, the grandparents, and the you know, and I know the kids now, and the, gra- the grandkids yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I live very close, so um, I have you know, like I'm, I have enough stuff. I have more than enough stuff, and that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to oh. share that. Whoa! I see. Without intimidating them, right? Loading. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, the thing to do, I have a, a friend in Jackson named Jesse Yancey, and he and children come to his, his garden all the time, and he shows them how to, to plant stuff. He he gets them to help him in his garden and gives them stuff to take back to their garden. So one of the things is from time to time, just have a little garden party, you know, or invite them over for, for you know, some tea or coffee or something, you know, while you're just putting around the yard and just get a casual conversation going. Um, you know, uh, maybe help them get a small bed started, you know, in their garden and then give them some plants that, you know, are unkillable to build up their confidence. And then they can take it from there and they'll feel more comfortable asking you and other people questions. But start them off with a nice bed that's well done. Show them how to do, dig a good hole without killing everybody and uh, and put out some plants that are basically take care of themselves. That will give them the confidence to take it from there. So start, well, start small. And I'm thinking – I'm thinking to tell them that you know every every gardener kills a bunch of plants, okay? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, but, but, you know, uh, I mean, I, I I'm know. even I'm loaning things to them in containers so that they can, you know, see yeah. the difference between the mature plant. Um, and, and, you know, it's like you try to, you know, and and there give you out, the, you know, the information about, okay, well, you can seed this, you, you know, it's like we can clone right. this, you know, okay. yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. The the other thing is, you know, you you. You, they know that people, the expert, I have plants that die. I can tell people that all the time, but it doesn't make them feel any better when their plants die. So that's all I'm saying is is it come, come up with a project, a small project you can help them with, and uh, and then get some conversation going about trying to teach them everything at once. You know, In other words, let them tr- start small and build on success, and then just and, and let's take it from there. All righty? So um, so far so good, right? That's right. That's right. Don't 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 try too hard. Let them let them uh, give them some unkill. Give them a can of plant. And let them take. Give them a weed. And let them take it from there. <laughs> yes, sir. Please. All right. Appreciate it. You know, I don't think that there's an easier way to learn how to garden than to be given something you can't kill and you want to pull some of it up and you give it away, and all of a sudden you've completed that circuit. So you want to start a new garden or something, give them something that's really weedy, <laughs> and then uh, show them how to share with other people. Hey, let's slide over a little bit to the west of Biloxi. Good morning, Greg. How are you doing this morning? Good morning. How are the coast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh. I've got an update for you. Uh, I've called you a few times. I've got a an old historic live oak tree uh, down near the water's edge here on the coast yeah. that uh, was in serious decline, and I called you, it's been a year or two ago, um, you know, it was putting up suckers underneath that we were having to mow, and uh, you'd mentioned that that's probably, since it's in decline, the roots trying to put up a new tree. Uh, I have since... Uh, found uh, a company that does a really interesting thing. They learned it in Texas where they would, they don't do this here, but in Texas they would put dynamite in the ground underneath these um, pecan trees to fracture the roots and cause new growth. 
and they have a <laughs> process here where they inject water and fertilize down into the ground and fracture the roots, and it is bringing that tree back. They did it very successfully in the median on Highway 90 up uh, around yeah. Henry, where one of those old trees was in the yeah. climb. Yeah. It had gotten poisoned, actually. And uh, what I'm thinking is it appears that the suckers coming out of the ground are less. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe it's working. I was wondering if you had a thought about it. Well, uh, anytime you aerate the soils, for, you know, fracture, you don't have to fracture, but aerating basically f- micro fractures the soil. And uh, there's, right. there's, a tree, there's tree companies that have these uh, soil injectors. If they do nothing but just blow water in there, then the water, mm-hmm. as it, you know, th- that also creates spaces for air because when the water uh, soaks in, then it leaves those same fissures for air to go into. So any kind of aerating is always going to help. But whether or not mm-hmm. it's going to help help on the uh, the root suckers or not, I, that's a whole different set of plant physiology. You know, t- two, two separate different systems going there. And I don't know that there's a correlation because they're, they're two separate things. Uh, but, you know, I can see a connection, but I don't speculate on stuff. I just know that aerating does help. Well, the foliage seems to be thickening on the tree. And... Um... I'm thinking there's less sulfur, so they did say it'll be years before we really know. So yeah. uh, it's an interesting yeah. thing. The tree's probably a hundred years old, so I'm anxious. Yeah. To say. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's uh, call me in a uh, half a century. Let's see what it's looking like. I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Safe travel. <laughs> okay. Appreciate it. Oh me, I'm I'm not trying to be flipping on that, but you know, I just try not to speculate on stuff. I try to stick with what I know. And speaking of what I know. I learned something this week that I, I, you know, I've been digging holes for well over half a century. I worked at a garden center where we grew stuff in fields and dug them up back in the 1970s. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and I have dug thousands of holes, okay? And I've always dug round holes just deep enough to put the plant in and plenty wide. And I always tell people to loosen up the edges of the holes so that roots when you plant, roots can keep on going straight out through that wall instead of hitting a slick wall. So I've been saying this for, for decades. Dig a round hole, dig it wide, dig it shallow, loosen up the sides. And so a friend of mine who's a garden writer uh, up, in, up in Quebec, Canada, he said, Felder, just dig a square hole. <laughs> dig a square hole. And forget about all that roughing up sides and all that. So just dig a square hole and the roots get to the edge, they'll keep on going. <laughs> That's so stupid, and it immediately changes everything that I'm doing about digging holes since I've done all my life. How about that job? I live and learn the stupidest stuff. Dig a square hole. <laughs> Tell me. I guess I'm getting kind of silly here, aren't I? Mm, no, no, no. And to be honest, that was one of the things um, Crystal quoted about you because uh, she was digging holes for the, uh, for the, for the plants that we just received. About loosening up the sides? Yes, sir, because I was, I was going at it, and she was like, it doesn't have to be that deep. Just make sure the sides are are, are open. Uh, that's what Felder says. I was like, oh, yeah. he does. Oh, okay. Yeah, he does well, say that. <laughs> well, you can say that's what Felder used to say. Now he says just dig a square hole. Square holes triangle. are in. Or, square holes. Or, or, or a triangle. Just whatever's easy. <laughs> Hey, man, uh, if we got uh, time to talk to Steve up in Memphis before we listen to some music. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, go get off the Gulf Coast and uh, head up north. Okay, we head up to Memphis. Hey, Steve, good morning, sir. How are you? Uh, good morning. Thanks. I'm great. Uh, nice to talk to you, fella, in England. Sure. Um, yeah. We, my daughter has a couple of shrubs in her yard that were badly singed by the winter cold um we we think they're hawthorn bushes she thinks it's an indian hawthorn yeah so they turned all brown i wanted to cut them all back at the moment and she said no and now they're they're greening out really maybe 10 percent greening out the rest is all brown and ugly and now she wants to cut them all back the question is if i if i cut them all back at this six months later am i going to kill them no, as a matter of fact, sort of the, the and this is the, just a general rule of thumb based on when the, the average first freeze gets here. In general, you can prune shrubs back pretty good bit is up until about the middle of August, and still have time for the new growth to come out and toughen up before winter. So I'd say any time this month would be great. 
But now keep this in mind. Two two things. First of all, try to do it when your daughter's not there because she <laughs> knows. You know what I'm saying? Uh, well, second of maybe. all, wherever you make your cuts, well, see that uh, unless she's going to help you. But wherever you make the cuts, that's where the growth comes out. So cut them back further than you want to, so they grow back out to where she wants them. See what I'm saying? Well, yeah. I mean, this thing is really badly singed. I was thinking I was going to cut it yeah. all back to to some stubs that are yeah. I, I don't yeah. know what a foot long, you know. There's no problem with that at all. Just keep in mind, wherever you make that cut, that's what. So, so, so when you end up cutting it back, there's not going to be any leaves left on it. Maybe not even any right. twigs left. But do right. it in a kind of a kind of a, a snow cone curved shape, sure. so that the new sure. growth comes out. Shape, unless she wants it to be square. But the main thing is, the new growth is going to come out right where you make the cut. And let me give you one more tip: if you have time, if the new growth comes out pretty quick, which it should, might take might take a month, but when it comes out and gets a few inches long, sometime by the first part of September, snip the tips off that new growth. So instead of getting long and skinny, it will bush out. I got you. See what I'm saying? Okay. And, uh, and I, yep. I think if you do that by the first part of September, the new growth that comes out will have time to, to harden up before before winter. So hard cut as soon as you can, light sure. touch in late August or early September. And, uh, and sure. it'll work fine. It'll work fine. Okay. Okay. Great. Hey, let me quickly uh, suggest one other plant that grows great around here. You had one guy suggesting that, if you don't mind. We, we've been sure. growing uh, Chinese long beans. They come in red and green. We've been growing red beans that are about two feet long, and you eat them <laughs> just like just about string. They're beautiful, by the way. They come in long red pears, and they you eat them just like a string bean, but they love the 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 southern heat. Uh, so they're real cool. They vine up. What was it? What was the name you called them? Well, they're long Chinese red beans. Cool. Uh, noodle cool. beans, I guess, is what they're no- called. Uh, cool. Um, cool. And and they're they're really beautiful, but they just grow I, great in the in the in the heat. I, I think that's good land yet. Growing something that's pretty to look at. When you're tired of looking at it, you can eat it. Thank you, Steve. I hey, appreciate you bet. it, man. You bet. Hey, thank you. All appreciate right. it. Hey, hey, hug your girl, okay? Yeah, thank you. Will do. Thanks. <laughs> See you. Bye. Okay, Java. Let's let's do some cheesy music. Let me mention this. I've done a new blog. I only do a blog. I'm not one of these who blogs twice a week. I make a new blog every three or four months. I just did one. That I think it's going to be real interesting. To some readers, if you do it, if you like doing more than just sitting out there and looking at stuff, go to Felderrushing dot blog. B L O G. Felderrushing blog. And scroll down to where it says, visit my blog. And I think you'd be real surprised at how we can smell the garden and how the garden becomes part of us as we smell it. Anyway, fellarushing.blog. Let me know what you think about it. We're going to take a real quick break, do a short, cheesy tune about summertime. And me and Java and the folks here at MPB, we're going to be right back and talk about gardening. Stick with us, folks. Okie dokie folks, welcome back Horticulture's fell to rushing And uh, we're talking about gardening And by the way, Java, did you get that picture I sent you to put with our podcast this week? Yeah, I did It was a, a nice flower arrangement In your classic your classic mug <laughs> Yeah, well it, There's the two things I want to mention there. First of all, uh, and, and anybody can see this If you just go to MP I don't when are you gonna put this podcast up today, tomorrow? Yeah, we're gonna put it up later today, and they can go to um, the Gestalt Gardener. dot mpb online. dot org. Yeah, well, it's all the every picture in that MPB coffee cup I took. Every flower I picked on a walk less than half a mile from where I live. Every one of those are just wildflowers growing out in fields and stuff. It's astounding. Uh, I'm also going to put a, 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 we'll talk about this next week, I'm putting it up on the Mississippi Gardening uh, Facebook page with the names of all the flowers in there. But here's the funny thing, Java. You were out last week. It was a family funeral, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, you were out, but uh, I, I posted a picture that I because I brought my MPB cup over here. I'm taking it everywhere I go, and 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 uh, MPB face mask too. But anyway, I posted a picture last week, and the first thing somebody said was, 
Where's the funky mug? Where's the nasty coffee cup mug? Because I broke it. I broke it. I put a chip in it, and I couldn't bring it with me. So I've got a clean mug that I'm working on right now. Just want to let folks know that I'm not giving up just because I broke one cup. I can trash out another one. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's slide down to uh, to the western edge of the Pines, Canada, to you, Pearl. Hey, Rachel, good morning. How are you doing today? Good morning. I'm well. Thank you. Hope good. you are. Good. So far, so, so good. Uh the city of Eupora is going to be spraying uh, weeds on the side of the alleyway right next to my yard. Right. And it's where my uh, dog sometimes uh, pilfers about. And I'm wondering, is that going to be harmful to her? Well, it depends on what they spray. Um, you know, I, I get accused by some people about, you know, recommending toxic chemicals all the time, and I don't because I'm aware of environment, health, health, environmental issues. If what they're spraying is going to be Roundup or something similar to Roundup, it's not going to be a problem. It's really not because that stuff is fairly mild. It's as poisonous as red meat and fried food. So, in other words, I would if you ever give your, your, your dog a, a French fry or a burger or something like that, that's not a problem. But if they're using something else, I'd need to know what it is before I could say for sure. The thing uh-huh. the thing, thing to do is when the weeds turn brown, if you could go out there with a string trimmer and then cut them down, then the dog won't be tempted to chew on them. Uh-huh. They're already short. They just want to kill what's uh, left of them. They mow, well, and now they want to kill what's left. They're probably going to use Roundup. I'm not sure, but again, it's it's probably the safest of anything that they could use. But um, uh-huh. as long as you, as long as your dog's not going to be chewing on it, I wouldn't worry about it at all. I really wouldn't. Okay. All right. Thank you, Felder. That's a really good question. I appreciate you asking about it. Thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. All righty. And uh, Java, I hate to be this way, but uh, I've come across some pretty bad vegetable puns. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, but, but first of all, I gotta make you. I gotta say that vegetable puns make me feel great from my head to my toes. Um, Fred, we got a couple callers. <laughs> <laughs> do we really? Yes, we do. Let's go to uh, Lane in Florence. <laughs> Hey, Lane, good morning. Thank you for saving Java for some bad, bad jokes. That's awesome. You know, I'm like, all I have is a recommendation for some greens for growing during the summer. Great. They, um, yes, they have down at the farmer's market. They um, ha- sell a green called uh, calla loop, which is a type of edible amaranth. Uh, it's popular down in the Caribbean and all. They sell a lot of it. It grows really well in the summer, and the taste is wonderful. It's could, could actually you, could you could you spell that? Uh, Calla C A L L A L O O. Calla. I'll 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 see what I can find about that because I'm always interested in, in summertime. You know, we're sort of stuck with tomatoes and peppers and squash and That's beans right. and corn, but there's some really cool things that are good. They're nutritious. They're easier to grow. We're just not as familiar with them, and so we need to get. A, I need to come up with a little recommendation of those kind of things. But I'll yes, look that Mal- one up. The Malabar spinach is a wonderful green that grows very prolifically. The heat doesn't bother whatsoever. It's no. like a beautiful plant. It's a little yeah, challenging yeah. to cook. I mean, it's uh, you stir fry it and all, and it's, you know, it's not as good as turnips or mustard or even this cantaloupe. No, but it's green, and in the summertime, that's it's right. hard to find edible greens. So that's, hey, a, that's, that's, right. that's a great tip. That's a great tip. But they sell a lot of cantaloupe down at the uh, farmer's market and all. They look, it's actually a relative of pigweed, a kind of a yeah, a amaranth. A weed. Yeah. Yes, amaranth. Cool. Well, yeah, well, you know, a lot of people don't realize that a whole bunch of what we call weeds of our vegetables are, are just weeds in other places. That's right. Now, they've had two varieties of Aztecs grew it for grain, but it's also been bred for uh, for uh, greens and our quick growing uh, summertime greens. It's popular in Asia, India. Very Asia. cool, man. Very right. cool. Matter you, you sort of, you, you know, you and the, the earlier caller from, from up in Memphis and the one down in. I've already forgotten where you're calling from. Anyway, I'm gonna to put together a little little publication on unusual summer edibles. That's a it's a and I'll I'll, I'll look up Callaloo. All right, thank you very much. Oh no, thank you. I appreciate it. Woo! This is what makes it a party.
All righty, folks. Now to slide up to Lafayette County, to Oxford. Hey, Corrine, good morning. Hi there. How are you? So far, so good. Not so bad. Good. I have a couple of questions, and I'm going to try to debrief. The first one is, what is the best way to remove a stump? It's expensive to have someone come do it. And the second one is, I have a uh, crepe myrtle that got the disease last year that made it all white, but, and I cut it back, but it's coming back mostly at the bottom. But some yeah. of the, should I cut it out? Okay, now let, let's, let's do this one first. Is it the one, is it the crepe myrtle bark scale, the little white scale insects on it? Yes. Okay. Yes. There, there, and I have to be real emphatic about that. I work with people in Mississippi State, also at Texas A&M, University of Georgia, the American Crepe Myrtle Society, and I am sure that the only control for that is going to be a liquid systemic insecticide put in the soil at the base of the tree in March, April, May, or early June, springtime. I'm sure that that's the only control. The other people can say different stuff. Uh uh-uh. uh. I'm working with the, 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 the people who are working on this. So, unless you want to use that systemic insecticide every year or two, there's not much we can do about it. And it's just going to be an ugly plant. That's all there is to it. You can. And you can yeah. cut it back, and the new growth will sort of outrun them the first part of the summer. But that's it. That looks like, like what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. But, I'm, you know, I have to stick with, with, with what we know for sure, and that's the only – in spraying the trees, scrubbing the trees. No. The systemic yeah. insecticide put in the soil in the spring. Yeah. So sorry about that. As far as the, the stump, there's, there's two approaches, one, three approaches. One is pay somebody to grind it out. You know, that that's the quickest way. Uh, yeah. But then you're still still going to be stuck with big roots that are going to decompose over the years, and that's going to cave in, making root-shaped holes in the ground. Um, the other thing is to, I hate to say this, just cut it off flat, put you some potted plants on top of it, you know, and yeah. just let well, it be, be its thing. You know, that works probably better than... <laughs> anything you know you can also drill holes in it stick a piece of the rebar in it and put bottles on the rebar in other words make it part of, you know just go with it perfect uh, yeah the third yeah. the third thing is if you were to drill a bunch of holes in it and then throw dirt in those holes the dirt has got wood decay fungi the holes will get it down into the wood and it'll also aerate it where water and air can penetrate and that'll cause it to decompose much more rapidly than just a plain old thing so drill a bunch of holes Throwing some dirt on it will help speed it up more than anything I know. So those are your three options. Wow. I would like to put a Japanese maple. It's in my front, one of my front flower beds, and I thought uh-huh. I put a, a small Japanese maple in the spot that that was. If I did with the the dirt, the drill and the dirt, would, would that enable well, me to do that? Here's a problem with that, and 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 I, you know, my son bought a nice house. This, he's the third owner of it, and there were some trees that were cut down. The house is built, and right now they're making holes bigger than he can fill up because wow. the shape the, the shape of the trunk and the the size of the roots that were growing under the ground, going straight out from the trunk. Those yeah. are made out of wood, and when they decompose, it's going to be thin air full of sawdust, and it's going to cave in. And that's not good conditions for the roots of a new tree, especially a Japanese maple. So, you know, you might want to plant the maple off to one side or the other because yeah, we you get, that. that's, that's going to be nothing but just a, a hole full of sawdust over the next five or six, eight years. That's all it is okay. to it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And good luck. Okay. Bye. Sorry about your crepe myrtle. <laughs> Bye. Oh, man, I deal with this all the time. I hate to be bearer of bad news, but I'm the one. I'm not trying to sell anything. And, you know, the approaches are pretty straightforward to me. Now, speaking of Oxford, let's stay in Oxford and talk to a guy named Chico. Are you the Chico with the, that red-headed thing? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm calling about my red-headed woman. Uh, Java mentioned that his better half sometimes quotes from Felder's little green book of quotations. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they're well, wrong, you know. <laughs> well, whenever I'm laying up in the air conditioning reading the new Ace Atkins novel or whatever, and she will strongly suggest that I get out and cut the yard, Yeah. as soon as I open my mouth, 
She says, I don't care what Felder says. And I had to go <laughs> cut the grass. Yeah, you know what? I met that redhead at that woman of yours, and I would just say, yes, ma'am, and go cut the grass. Thanks That's what I call, do, Felder. <laughs> Thanks for your call, Chico. <laughs> All right, y'all. Yeah, let me let me let me say something emphatically here, Java. I wish you would record this and we would play it every week. Felder doesn't know everything, you know, and sometimes he's wrong. There, I said it. And we're gonna isolate that, and it's gonna become a button on our uh, <laughs> on our machine. <laughs> and not all that, but I used to have a button, one of these little lapel buttons I wore. It says, "Take my advice. I'm not using it," and it's not a joke. Well, hopefully this next call, is, uh, they, they may take your advice. We got um, Richard in Raymond who wants to um, ask you a question this morning. Okay. Hey, Richard. Good morning, sir. Hey, Mr. Felder. How are you doing this morning? Not so bad. What's going on? So I've got a big old oak tree in my backyard. I just bought the house about a year ago. And about 15 or 20 foot up, it had a branch break off years and years back. And that end has rotted, and I think it's gone down into the trunk some. And now yep. I'm starting to get pockets of black ooze or slime almost coming through the yep. bark of the tree. Yeah. And yeah. I'm curious if there's anything I can do to save this big old thing or just enjoy her till she comes over. Yep, both of those, both of those. Uh, here's here's the deal. Uh, as the case sets in or woodpeckers or any kind of injury, uh, the trees have got tubes that go up and down. Some take water and nutrients up, and some take nutrients from the leaves down. And when one of those tubes gets clogged up, the tree can spring a leak, and the sap just oozes down the side. And you can tell which way it is, by this is a stupid thing to know, but if it smells kind of sweet or if it's got insects around it, that's a tube coming down from the, it's sort of like maple syrup, uh, whatever kind of tree you've got. And so it's got insect, that's called wet wood or slime fly. Anyway, and if, if it doesn't do that, then it doesn't smell in this uh, up tube. But anyway, nothing you can do about it. You could try drilling a hole about an inch or so deep above or below that and see if it doesn't spurt out and if it does that you can um tap a little tube or something in there sort of like to do maple syrup and let it drain away from the tree but there's no way to treat it okay i appreciate it okay sorry about that it's called wet wood by the way thank you so much i appreciate the information <laughs> good luck on it yes sir huh. all righty java i was getting a somebody calling from Oregon while we're on uh, interrupting my phone call. It didn't bother you. So they don't it? They don't know we're on the air right now? <laughs> it's, it's spam. I, you know, the past month and a half, two months, I've gotten so much spam on my phone. I, I didn't think you could do that on the phone. But yeah, no, they, yeah they, you have to set yourself up where they won't call or put the spam blocker on. And that's yeah. a conversation for Everyday Tech, which comes on every Wednesday at 10 a.m. <laughs> okay, I, I will give them a call. I will give them a call. So what, what, we got any callers? No, we we got a few. We have about eight minutes left. Uh, if someone wants to um, jump in and get a last question uh, for the for the uh, hour, but I guess we can go ahead and get one of those uh, vegetable puns in. <laughs> well, how, 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 how about how about this one? Uh, a tomato went out with a prune because it couldn't find any other date. Yeah. Oh, no. oh I, no. Here, here's a go. What tomato smells the good? Uh, I don't know. Aroma. <laughs> no, I'll go with that one. I, I'll go with that one. That's all right. Okay. That's all right. Well, one last one here. Basil and tomato soup is a superb com combination. Superb combination. Oh, okay. So you had yeah, to tell yeah. the joke. You had to tell the joke twice. Okay, I get it now. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> but a, but a bump. <laughs> I, I, I would like to encourage our listeners. Uh, a lot of people say, I don't do Facebook. I don't do social. I, I, I get that. I don't do it myself either. But there is one Facebook page that I go to regularly, and it's called Mississippi Gardening. Facebook, Mississippi. Now, there's Mississippi Gardens and uh, Mississippi Gardening Magazine. But this is called Mississippi Gardening. It's Facebook, and it's Garden Variety Gardeners and a few errant experts thrown in, posting pictures of their yards, having questions, sharing what they know, a lot of funny things there, a lot of beautiful gardens all around Mississippi. And if you want to go to that, it's Mississippi Gardening Facebook. 
But uh, if you want to see my latest blog, my one every three or four month blog I do, it's always about something garden related, but it's never any how to stuff. This is about the uh, about how we literally have our gardens in our veins, in our bloodstream. And if you want to read about that, it's, it's, it's lighthearted. It's not very long. Uh, go to felderrushing.blog, and then scroll down. It's got a little banner that says, says uh, uh, view my blog, and click on that. It'll take you to this latest thing I've got. I also have things about the garden saints, saints of gardening, uh, about what makes wood uh, last longer on a deck by whether it's bark up or bark down, where the old gnomes go where they die. It's just got all sorts of just ob- garden observation stuff, not any how to. But again, that's still the Russian dot blog. You cannot buy anything there. I don't even know how to put that kind of link on there. It's just nothing but me knocking around having a little fun. So if you want to give that a try, uh, that'd be fun. And I uh, would like to also uh, give a quote. I was uh, listening to Neil uh, Negras Tyson. He's an astrophysicist. You know about him, Java, Neil Tyson? Oh, yeah, Neil Negras Tyson. Yeah, he's a great, yeah. great guy. He is incredible. He is incredible. But he said something, and, and this came to mind when I learned about just digging a square hole. Uh, he said, the more baffled you have been in your life, the more open your mind becomes to new ideas. And I get stumped. All the time. I love it. I love getting stumped. Uh, I heard somebody say, well, Felder doesn't, he doesn't know everything. Well, I'm telling you, I don't know everything. And I have epiphanies all the time. So, uh, so let's learn together. That's what the Gestalt Gardener here on MPB is about. We throw stuff out. If you got a difference of opinion or, or you want to clarify or want to, to throw in some additional information, give us a call. Let's turn it into a party. I'm not going to bite. Now, Felder, I know you say you're going to get ready to go out to, you know, some of the um, different flower shows and, and gardening yep. places. Um, yep. Is the is the Chelsea uh, flower show happening this year? I know that's, a, you know, one of the biggest biggest yeah. in the world. It's, it's one of the oldest in the world, and it's, it's the premier worldwide. And I've gone to it for many, many, many years, since back to the 90s. Uh, and last year was the first time it's ever – they held it during World War II. But uh, the COVID kicked out. Well, they're having it this year. Instead of in May like they usually do, they're having it in September. I'm going to be back in, in home in my own garden by then. But So I'm going to try to take in a, a brand-new Royal Horticulture Society garden, first one they've done in uh, maybe 75 years or so. And uh, you got to remember, England is not the size of Mississippi, and they've got five official world-class botanic gardens all over the place. And they're just opening a new one not very far from me, so I can hop on a train with a mask and go right there. I'm always looking for little ideas that we can do in our gardens, not what's this weird plant that won't grow in Mississippi. I'm always looking for little ideas that enhance the quality of our gardens. So that's what I'm doing. Now, let me ask this question, Felder. We could run up on the end of the show, but between England and Mississippi, who has the most gnomes in their garden? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Well, if, if you put my garden in, it would be Mississippi because I got a lot of gnomes. But no, uh, gnomes are, are 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 all over England. Matter of fact, the first ever gnome introduced in England has been insured for over a million pounds. That's like a million and a quarter dollars it's insured. <laughs> but anyway, gnomes, scarecrows, garden saints, uh, MSU bulldogs, reds, whatever you want to put out in your yard, accessories are accessories, and the, all good gardens have got some kind of original artwork or accessory that puts your spin on it. Doesn't have to be fancy. Couldn't doesn't have to be a bottle tree or a lion statue. Just put something out there that it creates a focal point that gives it personality that the garden swirls around all year long. And then t- take a kid to a garden center. Take them to a farmer's market. Let them meet somebody who grows stuff for a living and let them learn how to ask a few questions. Show them how to do what we do best, folks, and that's get dirty. I'll be back same time, same place, right here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Me and Job and everybody 